I'm here to speak to you today about my vision for better government. This is about a type of government which is accountable, uh, is able to demonstrate how uh, all decisions are made, how all actions are taken, how all policy and services and everything that government administers is done in a way that is demonstrably lawful, demonstrably um, uh, aligned to the mandate and uh, accountable actions of that government. I want to see a government that is participatory, where the people, the public, the communities, the families can not just um, deal with policies and services once they're launched, but can be an active contributor to or even raiser of new ideas, of new policies, of new things that they need to live well and can participate not just in the design of such policies or services, but in the governance and oversight. I'd love to see a government which is more humane, which brings our whole person to the job, which brings human measures of success, community measures of success, which brings values into the way that everything is done in the public service. How can you have humane outcomes if you don't have a humane workplace and humane policy making and humane ways of working? I wanna see a public service and a government which is adaptive, which is not just set and forget, but is constantly monitoring for and understanding and receiving feedback from the community on the impact of change. So that then we can truly take an iterative approach that is based on evidence, based on reality, based on the actual effects it's having on people so that we can constantly guide ourselves towards a better North Star. And I wanna see, of course, public services which are accessible. I wanna see a situation where everyone knows doesn't just have access according to their needs, in, in, but also has access to their rights, um, where everyone has access to uh, justice, everyone has access to um, everything they need to live well. Part of this is about all of us recognizing that you will always get something which is lower than your expectation. So if you start with a low expectation, guess what? You're gonna get something even lower than that. If we start to raise our expectations of government, of each other, of public servants, <laughs> um, if we start from a, why isn't it the best possible um, action, the best possible um, way of working? When you raise your expectations, you have a chance of changing towards that raised expectation. When you start from a low expectation, you're gonna get what you expected. So I'd like to encourage you all to start to raise your expectations of government, of public sector, and of society, so that we don't end up with a situation where cynicism defines the North Star. Policy is this weird word. It means literally pretty much anything. <laughs> uh, for some people, it is a couple of dot points on a napkin. For some people, it is the promise that the government of the day said. For some people, it's legislation. And the simple answer, it is actually all of these things. The one thing that I would suggest, particularly to a crowd like this, is that policy is like the operating system for our society. It sort of determines the rules, determines what's available to you, it determines the support mechanisms. Um, it is, <laughs> it's a series of libraries that we all draw upon every day, even if we don't notice it. Uh, when we drive our own cars, when we drive public transport, when we use the education system, when we use the health system, uh, even just, um, you know, catching up in a location like this. There are many, many, many policies that affect us every day. Uh, and, um, and that's why it's so critical we get involved in it. So this is my very cheeky way of describing what policy looks like. So for those um, who can't see the screen, I've got a cartoon here. And it basically starts with the policy team are celebrating. They're saying another great job. This is the current state of how policy is made in Australia generally and in a lot of countries. Great job. We got it out the door. Now onto the next policy. And in the back of their minds, the policy team are thinking, wow, I wish we had time to explore policy futures, to understand what this looks like, even to see what it means in implementation. But the policy instructions are thrown into a black hole, the black hole of policy intent. And from that black hole, uh, from which purpose is stripped out, those instructions are received by someone to implement it. It might be someone in a company that has to consume a regulation. It might be someone in a social services organisation that needs to um, build a new public service. It, need, it, might, it could be by anyone who has to consume these rules, who are sort of saying, what does this mean? Well, unfortunately, the team that wrote it are on to the next thing, and so let's just do our best. So there's a lot of guessing. And the people actually affected by bad policy Literally, it can ruin people's lives, as we've seen in recent months uh, through various rural commissions. So what we end up having is this black hole of policy impact. 
No one knows what the actual impact of policy is, and the people that are generally measuring policy are looking to measure the things that they expected, not looking for the unintended consequences. So it can be devastating. And of course, eventually you get an evaluation, either an evaluation team or a Royal Commission, which will eventually say <laughs> there was low intent, um, policy intent, or indeed if there was high policy realisation, um, there was harm created. I wish they'd evaluated sooner, but of course that's always the answer. Let's just evaluate sooner. And the problem is that an evaluation is a point in time, but it's not feeding into constant iteration, is it? In the tech sector, we all shifted years ago now into continuous improvement uh, for systems, for products, for services, but there's no equivalent yet in policy. So what we've got is a situation where there's a gap, a gap between policy and delivery. Um, and it is a big gap. And just to give you an example of um, the sort of stories, I remember going to a regulatory conference, a regulators conference, and a regulator got up and said, there's nothing wrong with our policy. Our policy was perfect. It was the implementation that was the problem. And I got up straight after this person said, as one of your besmirched implementation people, I could have told you that when you did regulation for heart monitors, which is the regulation he was talking about, you know, anyone with a technical bent could have told you that open Wi-Fi was a bad idea. Um, the fact is that every piece of policy, every regulation, every legislation is being implemented in technology today. Which means if you don't have multidisciplinary teams, if you don't have technologists together with data, together with social activists, together with um, you know, highly diverse perspectives and experiences in the room when you're developing policy, then chances are, first of all, it'll probably miss the mark and chances are it will probably not be fit for purpose and chances are it will probably create unintended exp um, uh, consequences because you're developing it in isolation from those who can feed into it. And of course, the blindfolded baton passing between policy and delivery means that the people doing delivery can't feed back into policy. So you end up with a stagnant um, artifact very quickly. This is my dream, again, my future. We're on the way to getting there, but policy options and futures are continuously being explored, continuously being raised, not just from the policy team or from the government of the day, but from the public. <laughs> Here's a change. Uh, I've noticed a bug. <laughs> Why can't we actually have bug fixing of, um, of policy, of services, etc., from the public? Multidisciplinary disciplinary policy development where people and policy teams and implementation teams are co-designing not just the implementation but the policy intent, the instructions, the success criteria, and where you're actually monitoring and baselining not just the policy intent but the human impact from the start. And then you can be constantly monitoring that, uh, proactively managing that, and everyone working from the same policy infrastructure where you have policy as code, so a policy twin, a digital twin of policy, combined with impact monitoring, combined with actual escalation. So when things go wrong, which they will, you notice and you can do something about it and people don't need to have their lives ruined. So changing things starts with reimagining good. We currently have a highly manual process where policies are ideated quite often in political offices. A policy announcement is made, usually in the absence of any actual um, evidence. Um, then someone goes and develops the how can we create uh, options to meet this policy announcement. Legislative drafting is very slow and very manual. And, um, and I've literally read legislation where it's got a triple negative over the course of 10 pages. And years later, I spoke to that drafter and said, why? And his answer was fascinating to me. He said, I was just having a bad year. <laughs> like, the fact is, the way that we've come to write these things is so far from good, it's not even funny. So the parliamentary process will always be slow and a lot of debate and, you know, we can't really stop politicians being politicians. But publishing is fast. But once you have a new piece of legislation or regulation up, unless you're the sort of person that goes looking for and subscribing to those changes, who knows? You've got to discover it. You've got to interpret it. No one tells you when you've got it right, only when you've got it wrong. So you get myriad implementations, myriad um, interpretations and implementations. Um, and, um, and there's no assurance of whether it's the right thing. I see, again, a situation where policy ideation, if you actually had a policy twin, where anyone, including the political officers, could actually model and try things out. You can actually draft new regulation legislation as human and machine readable simultaneously. Not one, then codify that into the other, but actually implementing at the same time a reference implementation so you can feed the insights of that back into the human version and then you get something which is actually good. Imagine if um, at the point in time where a new piece of legislation or regulation was um, passed in the parliament, the API was up like that. 
Imagine if at the point of consulting on that prior to it even going to Parliament, you could actually have a reference implementation and test it. There's so much you can do when you actually start shifting to a um, digital and human approach to drafting these rules and we can start to dramatically improve the quality uh, and the integrity and the consistency of how they're applied. So there's lots of bits to this. This is my mind map. It's quite overwhelming. I'm so sorry. You're starting to see the brain of Pia <laughs> culminated over seven years. So sorry. Um, but here are sort of the enablers for that better pathway, right? So I'm not going to go through all, all of these today. In fact, I'm only going to touch on two today. But just really briefly, if you want to get persistent impact monitoring informed and continuous policy reform based on those impacts, you need to be monitoring. You need to have publicly available modelling tools. You need to uh, human impact measurements. What do you actually measure? What does quality of life look like? And of course, that's going to get very diverse when you start taking different knowledge systems into account. Actual public engagement on policy. My favourite participatory policy story is from Taiwan, where Uber did their usual backdoor brute force, try to get, you know, regulation to get them to do whatever they want. Um, but the way the government there works is, thank you for your suggestion, we're going to ask people. <laughs> and then they put out a, how would you feel about Uber coming into Taiwan? How do you feel? This is something we're really terrible at in, um, in the West. Uh, we sort of start with what do you think? And the problem is what you think is people get married to their ideas very hard. It's very hard to shift an idea, but shifting a heart is actually a little bit different. How do you feel draws out people's values and concerns and hopes? Uh, well, I feel like it could be a good opportunity to make some money. I, I'm worried that um, you know, someone's going to hurt me and, I'm, and there's not going to be any way, you know, any recount, recourse for that. It draws out everyone's hopes and fears and then you can start to draw out, well, what does that mean? And then, you, then what they did is invited the general public to participate in live legislative drafting. Live streamed live legislative drafting. How cool does that sound, right? Um, and then, uh, and they said to Uber, you're welcome to come or not. We don't mind. <laughs> um, and so rather than it being done in back, you know, back rooms by experts um, and lobbyists, it is actually done in the open. This is, again, a dream. So public engagement, um, my favourite um, piece of legislation in the world is, um, uh, again, total nerd here, um, is the right to an explanation. Is it well utilised or no? No. But in New Zealand, in the um, FOI equivalent over there, OIA, they have a thing called Section 23. Every citizen, every resident in New Zealand has a legal right to an explanation about any decision made about them by the government. What a beautiful piece of law. Uh, that would certainly change things quite substantially here. Um, human and um, you need policy and human indicators. You need a public repository. People can share stuff. You need escalation mechanisms, test suites, baselining, policy as code, and continuous monitoring. So I'm only going to look at these two together. So don't worry. <laughs> We're going to break this right down, but I wanted to give you, if you like, the whole picture and why they, um, pretty much all of it does end up coming back to um, a reliance upon policy as code. My origin story in this started at um, Austrac. Austrac is the um, uh, one of the Australian um, regulators of the financial sector, and they look after things like um, anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing regulation. And it was really interesting going there because a bunch of problems became really evident really quickly. And that's why I got onto this whole rules as code journey. Um, one of which was everyone's into, you know, has to go and read and interpret. And a lot of these principles based regulations, people are like, oh, what does that mean? I don't know. Let's try. <laughs> Did I get this right? Oh, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> oh, we're just going to find you when you get it wrong. So there's a lot of angst and a lot of stress. Um, so the seven problems I identified were first of all, we just need better rules. We need rules that are more easy to implement, model, et cetera because of that translation gap I, I spoke about before. So I joke a lot, much to my uh, ex-lawyer husband's um, annoyance, um, I joke a lot that we are currently using lawyers as modems. We're using lawyers to translate between analog and digital to sort of say, what does this legislation mean and how should we implement it? We need to adapt to digital. Uh, there's a lot of rules like the um, example about the heart monitor where they're just not making the assumption that things are going to be done in technology. So they don't have any geeks in the room. They don't have any technologists informing the, um, the policy design. So we need to create the understanding that everything that we're building is going to go into a digital system at some point. So we need to take that into account. A lot of regulations assume it's shaping a human behaviour. But of course, that's increasingly not the case. And a machine doesn't care about a legal, financial or criminal pressure. So if you're building a regulation to shape human behaviour and then the, core, the main consumer of that rule is actually a machine, 
then um, you're probably not going to get your outcome. Um, a lot of people just building, rebuilding the status quo with shiny new things. They're just speeding things up and running off a cliff. And there's a lot of disincentives. So they might have a key goal, but their secondary goals become um, um, the primary goal very quickly. And, um, and then they miss the outcome. So at OzTrack, one of the key goals is to strengthen the financial system against abuse. But then the secondary goals were to detect and to disrupt financial crime. Fine. All of the measures of success when I was there, this is a while ago now, were about how many criminals did we arrest and how many um, you know, non-compliant financial institutions did we fine. And the problem is that both, neither of those are naturally incentivized to strengthen the system against abuse. Both of them are you know, naturally incentivized to have a weak system so you can actually arrest more and, and fine more. So perverse incentives are a problem. But number six is trust, of course, um, government. Is, a, um, is not something that should ask for trust. It needs to earn trust. And there's all of that context where people are saying, well, you know, why are people ha happy to share data with the social media or, or um, you know, big tech or whatever? And the simple answer, realistically, is because those entities don't have the state monopoly on violence. Like, it's a fairly simple answer. Um, they can't come and arrest you or take your children. They can do some pretty awful things, but they don't, directly have the powers and, st um, and stressors the government does. So, and when you lose trust, you lose stability in a whole society. So it's a really critical problem to try and solve. And finally, policy impact. Uh, so I'm actually helping kick off a research project at the moment to look at what the unintended human impacts of public policy are, starting with robo debt, but also looking at working parents and all kinds of other social policies to try to actually say, see, you can measure and see when there's an adverse impact on a community and you should be able to understand that, flag it and escalate it and um, mitigate it uh, r without having to wait for a commission. So let me jump into rules of code, then I'm going to give you some examples. What, is, what sort of rules are we talking about? Um, a lot of legislation and regulation policy is made up of two types of things. There's prescriptive rules and judgment based. The prescriptive rules are the sort of things you want consistently applied. So those are the ones that fit this really well. So things that are eligibility criteria, calculation information, things that are about, um, um, you know, over $10,000 needs this action his, or this obligation based on this trigger. Uh, then there are judgment-based ones. So you might meet all of the prescriptive rules, for instance, to get citizenship, but then the judgment-based is that you have to pass a good character test, which obviously changes over time and is, is very judgment-based. So rules as code really fits prescriptive rules really well. It shouldn't be used, or I don't believe it should be used for prescriptive rules, uh, for judgment-based rules, and, um, and that certainly has played out in all the places that we've applied it. So it fits really well in service delivery, it fits really well in social policy, in taxation policy, in a lot of the, the quite prescriptive rules and regulations that you deal with all the time. Um, I've spoken about a little bit the why. Um, I have a couple of favourite tools. I'm going to talk about Open Fisker in a second, but there's another good one called Blocks that you can check out. All of this is available. What is not RAC, though? This isn't a, a source of constant argument. Um, there are definitely people who are like, oh, just, you know, just create XML. Structured content doesn't make it machine understandable. If it's not machine executable, then, um, and of course, using the word executable and policy in the same sentence is deeply uncomfortable. Um, but structured content is not rules as code, because if a machine can't parse it, then, then it's not actually machine, it's not rules as code, it's just rules as structure. Uh, it's not automated law, so anyone who's trying to, and there's plenty of tools that like this who are like, oh, it's all right, just push your, your rules into our system and it'll just automatically translate them or it'll just interpret them. Um, that's not rules as code because, of course, you've still got a black box of decision making. Uh, it's not a traditional rules engine. Traditional rules engine have business logic and the rules mashed up, which means that any change is very, very complex, as anyone that's dealt with rules engines knows. It's not an AI and it's not a website. It's been surprising to me how many people don't, and particularly when you start working with policy teams, they don't understand technology. They don't understand the difference between a website and rules as code. Um, and because lots of people are trying to sell into this place at the moment, into this space at the moment, they're sort of like, oh, well, someone just sold me this tool last week. It's like, yeah, but it's still a black box. Still can't see the rules. Still can't trace the decision back to the actual legislation and see if it's actually lawful. Um, so, excuse me for a second. Okay, all right, I'm done. Okay, there's lots of current use cases. I'm going to show you some examples in a second rather than going on. But step one for actually codifying rules is just understanding it. Read the legislation. 
do some concept modeling so that ev and it's been fascinating with completely brand new regulations like i've been involved in drafting when you say look we're not even going to try to draft it at all yet don't start writing it we won't start coding anything yet let's just step back and do a concept diagram. Let's just look at what this is supposed to achieve. And even just going through concept modeling has been able to flush out a whole bunch of assumptions, use cases. Oh, but if a per what if, you know, test cases that would, would break it. So that's been really, really helpful. Um, getting into then saying, well, what would the human readable ver version look like? And what might a machine readable version look like? Starting to draw that out gets um, actually then really helpful. So you have a, what, what they call isomorphic drafting. Then there's lots of opportunities to do modeling and all kinds of other tools. I'm actually going to show you a bit of a demo now. So yeah, read the legislation, identify the logic, create some test cases, and then start codifying in your favorite tool. So here are some examples I want to give you. In New Zealand, there's a thing called the Rates Rebate Act. Rates Rebate is ostensibly very simple. If you are a owner occupier, the, the policy was built to try to encourage um, particularly retirees to stay in their homes for longer, right? But no, of course, no one was measuring whether that policy intent was being met, whole different point. It's a really simple piece of legislation, as you can see. My favorite bit though is here, the actual calculation. A rate payer who was a rate payer of residential is entitled to so much of the rates payable for that rating year in respect to the property as represents two thirds of the amount by which those rates exceed $160 reduced by $1 for every $8 by which the ratepayer's income for the preceding tax year exceeded that amount, the last mentioned amount being increased by $500 in respect to each person who was dependent of the ratepayer at the commencement of the rating. Okay, so you can see even simple regulation gets quite interestingly annoying. That, however, um, because I'm a maths nerd as well, just turned out was a quadratic equation, which was cool. Mm -hmm. So I was able to just uh, codify that fairly simple. Uh, <laughs> sorry? Sing it. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so what we did with that was the actual um, coded version, we used a tool called OpenFisca. Uh, I love OpenFisca. It is complicated to get to know. But the reason I like it so much is it doesn't just provide rules as code for services. It provides the basis of being able to do whole of population modeling of change, which we've done now in three countries, where here's a policy, if I make this change to the policy or to the amount or to the variables or to the eligibility or to the rates, what impact will that have on the whole population? We've been, it's been such a good tool for exactly that purpose. So it sort of breaks it all down. Um, each one of these is a variable, which is then you know broken down in each of the variables. And the act, that actual calculation then is right here. Dunk, dunk, dunk. Rates total minus initial contribution minus divided by divided by three times by eight plus the allowable income. Yay! Um, what that then? So the sorry, I shouldn't. Yep, no, I'm going to run out of time if I keep going. So um, each one of the variables is defined. This is another key thing that I love about this particular tool is you can have all of the years. So you can um, rather than just having the current legislation. You can keep the rates over the years. You can keep the history of the change to the regulation or to the legislation. So you can see, oh, look at how people are affected today. I can run the same demographics against people 20 years ago and I can see the impact. Look, I can now see trends of who's getting more and less money over time. Uh, I can now see trends about um, who's being affected, uh, the size of the cohort that are affected by a policy based on the eligibility criteria, etc. So this ability to actually maintain history is actually quite helpful. Um, and then, uh, then you build test suites. This has been the most helpful thing for engaging with policy people. Because if we can say, wouldn't give them this exact thing, but if we can say, look, here's um, an input, here's the output that we think we should get. Is this right? They go and then do their manual calculation. They say, okay, yes, we can assure that these 10 test cases are right. Great. So now every time we run the code and we show them, look, your 10 test cases did come out as true. Are you comfortable? And they're like, oh, actually, yeah, that, that makes me feel a bit more comfortable. So test, it, it really helps to get the policy people engaged, but it also helps to flush out where sometimes where their assumptions are not right. That's then used by a bunch of different services, including this little rates calculator. Uh, so you can say how much rates. Anyone from New Zealand want to yell out their rates? $3,400 a year. Cool, $3,400 a year. Perfect. How many dependents? Same person? <laughs> Same person? Zero. Zero, perfect, thank you. Next question. So this has already done a call to our OpenFisca backend. 
because one of the things we found is a lot of superannuants don't know how much they earn exactly and it's actually quite um, undignified for them to engage in the process. So being able to say, look, if you earn less than this amount, you're going to get the full amount. Perfect. Okay, you get the full estimated amount. If you earn more than this amount, you're going to get zero because we had a lot of people who were going through all the pain of applying for this particular benefit or this particular rebate to then find out they were eligible for $1.50 kind of thing. Or somewhere in the middle, um, I, won't, I won't throw you into it. I'll just, oops, I'll just pick a number somewhere between there, 43,000. And, um, and then it says, okay, that's how much you will likely get. So this actually, just having that calculator available meant that thousands, thousands of retirees who were, it was such a stressful um, process and they were getting almost nothing out of the process um, could sort of say, oh, A, this is worth applying for or it's not. And then suddenly they could make a choice in their life. This is about trying to reverse that helpfulness of government rather than we're going to make it super hard and if you finally jump through our hoops you might get something it's more about how can I help you figure out everything that you are entitled to so as a quick follow-up to that given I'm almost running out of time uh, a little project in New Zealand that uh, a few of us recently did we took a bunch of benefits and we said well why don't we just encode all of them and all of these are available in Open Fisker as well and we said, okay, um, I am this, I am 24, 23 years old, I am currently without work, I'm this, 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 I have, let's say, none for the situation. I earn 100, I make blah, blah, blah. Am I wearing $200? Am I wearing, okay, that'll do. Ah, uh, I forget postcodes in New Zealand. Someone help me out? 5819. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So long as it's a, a legit one, then that'll be fine. So being able to then say, okay, what you've told us and what you're eligible for and, and roughly how much that's worth for you. These, and particularly the accommodation supplement, it is almost impossible to figure out what your accommodation supplement is in New Zealand. It is because it's based on where you live, on your amount, on your dependence, and a whole bunch of stuff that people find very hard to figure out. So this is already being used, a little project done by a bunch of just a little citizen group, bunch of um, largely volunteers working with Citizen Advice Bureau to build something so people could just figure out what they're entitled to. And very cheekily, how can I question a decision to help people say, oh, and here's an email template if you want to challenge a decision. <laughs> yeah, I'm not planting grenades at all. Um, so, um, there's lots of examples. I think you're already starting to get a bit of a feel for this. In Canada, we did a policy difference engine where we were able to show if you made this change to this regulation, here are all the people that will do better and all the people that will do worse. It's so important to be able to make those kinds of calls and, make those ki and, and help make those kinds of informed decisions. So, and there's lots and lots of papers, I've got them all linked. So to jump back to my slides briefly and then we'll do some questions. Um, what you end up with is better rules as a process. This idea of isomorphically drafting, taking a test-driven approach to drafting new policy, new regulation and new legislation specifically. Then being able to provide a reference implementation publicly, api.legislation.gov.au, .newsouthwales.gov.au, et cetera, is the dream because anything that is less than an API is probably not sufficient. Um, the whole point is to draw a line in the sand so that we can start getting better rules, so that we can start holding up all of our legislation and regulation in a way which is consumable, actionable, appealable, understandable um, by people more broadly. Um, and I'm going to jump past painful principles, but this is a key one as well, AI. There is, of course, a lot of automation happening in government um, and it is terrifying um, even as a person who works in government almost all the time it is it is terrifying so for me digital legislation and regulation is I genuinely believe a precondition for lawful AI because either you have a system where your software is consuming the rules which would be good because there's a whole bunch of you know rules-based AI that's 30 years old that works perfectly well it doesn't have to be machine learning based AI but even if you use machine learning based being able to test the output and the input of your system against the law is really important so that it's, you know, lawful. Um, the other thing is, so I've written a whole paper about how to create um, trustworthy and um, legitimate um, use of AI in government, particularly around ADM. And, um, and the other part of that is rule of law. Like people don't think about administrative law enough, which should explain your decision. But rule of law also holds that you should get a consistent um, outcome 
you know, all people should get the cons same consistent outcome. Um, and uh, if you've got a machine just changing the output over time because it's learning, but it's not a person accountable for that shift, then that can also get quite um, dangerous as well. So human services need human measures, human futures and human participation, participatory governance. I've given you the uh, Taiwan example, but there's also a huge amount of opportunity around drawing on indigenous knowledge systems so that we're not just planning for the next financial quarter or the next electoral cycle, but we're actually trying to plan 50 and 100 years out so we get values-based futures we're working towards. Uh, and the last I'll say is my epiphanies of, over this time. Seven years of epiphanies, boiled down to one slide. Here you go. <laughs> Rules and business logic need to have an amicable separation. Every one of you that's worked with Rules Engine, how many people have worked with Rules Engines? Not many. Ah, oh, some of you have been spared that pain. So <laughs> Rules Engines are so hard because someone over here says, here's all the rules and the business requirements, and a business analyst goes, ah, oh, here's what it all kind of means, and then someone codes it all up, and then there's a change. <laughs> and then you keep having to jump through the cycle of the change coming out, having to refactor all of your business logic, and then re-implement into your rules. If you actually separate your business logic and keep the business logic in your applications and just have the rules as code, just rules as code, then just the legislation as code that you can consume by all these different applications, then suddenly you have uh, a lot more consistency of how it's applied, but also easy of man ease of management when change happens. I think legislation and regulation is part of the digital public infrastructure that we need. There is a lot, particularly with any you know, emerging trend, a lot of snake oil salespeople, so worth keeping an eye out for. And a lot of people who are not snake oil salespeople, they're just driven by their own thing. There's a lot of na um, natural learning people who love this space because they get to apply all their skills. But if you just build a tool that just keeps um, parsing badly drafted reg regulation legislation in the first place, you're actually propping up a system that itself needs to change. Um, there is a strong coalition of the willing globally, worth getting involved in, and anything short of API.legislation.gov.au is not enough. People who are like, oh, technology doesn't really matter. You just need to have a good, you know, um, um, you just need to have a, a good concept model architecture. It's like, oh, ah, ah. So I've got a whole bunch of links here, a whole bunch of materials, a whole bunch of case studies. I'm going to stop and take some questions. I hope that's been informative and useful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry if I rushed you to it towards no. the end. That was just absolutely fantastic. Do we have any questions to start us off? There's one down here. I think Russell, are you heading towards anyone, Russell? Or have we got one here? No. It's all right. I can, I've got two actually. We'll start with you. Um, fantastic talk. I'm trying to work out how do you engage governments that aren't already on the bandwagon? Like you've, you've, you've shown some examples with the, the rates calculator and whatnot. There's evidently yeah. some engagement with government to actually use this process to get there. Sure. How, how do you bootstrap that? Like they're, they're, if you are interested in having better government, how, how do you get them to do this? Cool. So I'll give you three strategies just real quick. Um, because policy and delivery are physically separated between a lot of departments. If you're dealing with an implementation agency, rules as code is a great way for them to save money. Uh, so for an implementation agency, the cost of change for traditional rules models is, um, rules engines is extraordinarily high. They feel the pain of poorly drafted policy. They feel the pain of, when you said this, what did you mean? Because by the way, how I interpret that could affect thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, right? So for implementation agencies saying, regardless of how it's drafted, you could run your legislation as code as a way to actually um, minimise your own complexity, to simplify your own service delivery, to improve uh, change management, and to actually test the outcomes of your systems against the law to make sure it's lawful before it, you know, pumps out to a person. For a policy agency, they're only starting to realise that they're part of the problem. <laughs> um, so it's a different type of conversation, but it, that conversation is already starting to happen. My personal hack that I'm going to try to do this year, and I mean that in the civic hack way, um, is um, I'm working with the person who's one of the authors of the, the Australian Policy Handbook and the Australian Policy Cycle to try to rewrite that, for instance, to actually make this a normal process. Um, so working with policy agencies and showing them, look, if you isomorphically draft, you can take a test-driven approach. Why not have a couple of people that have consumed this rule? And what I found is every policy team that has experienced having someone in the room that's going to naturally consume the rule and then getting a better policy, getting something which is implemented 
closer to what they imagined in the first place, every time they experience that, they, they want to change. So that's how to do with implementation. That's how to do with policy agencies. With the um, Parliamentary Council Office, which is the key one to change, the problem is they don't have any tech capability. So little call out. We need great techie people with innovative minds and open source mentalities to work in government. Come play, please. <laughs> that would be my third strategy. Come, come and join the, the workforce and help. Thank you. Cool. Thank you once again. G'day. Um, uh, Dr. Andrew Lee, uh, the member for Fenno in Canberra, um, really likes randomised controlled trials. Yeah. And I'm wondering where that fits in. Are they the tests? Are they the 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 um, feedback that go to policymakers? Yeah. Is that part of the plan? So the when you take a better rules process in the first instance, um, and there are some agencies who have started doing more, let's call it design-led um, approach to policy. Um, so. <laughs> People that just want to do A-B testing, the challenge is that you may, you can A-B test your way to a spoon from a rock over a thousand iterations, right? But if you actually ask a person what they're trying to do and they say, I'm trying to drink some soup, you might give them a spoon to start. So I think that A-B testing and, and randomized testing has a role to play, but it shouldn't be the start of the process, if you see what I mean? Like the start of the process should be that concept modeling, that what are we trying to achieve and what are the different ways that we might achieve that? It might be a grant, it might be a piece of regulation, it might be a service, it might be tweaking something that already exists. Um, but it certainly should involve the people affected by that policy to be part of that ideation process before they even um, commit to one way or the other, as it were. Um, so, but yeah, then actually monitoring for impact is really critical. The other problem with um, randomised testing and, um, and, and A-B testing and policy is if it's something as critical as social services, what happens to the Bs, as it were? So, so some of this has to be done in, in um, not just collaboration with people, but in micro-testing before you push it out, uh, just because of the absolute critical nature of some, of some of the things that government provides. So participatory design led from the start, um, and, um, and then micro-testing before things are rolled out, I think are probably really key. Well, a few. Thanks. Um, so uh, I just want to start by saying I love this stuff. So you had me at hello. Um, <laughs> but I do have a question. Um, from the inside, it seems that uh, the, the biggest barrier we have to overcome in getting all of these things to come together and, and produce these great outcomes is that that none of the players trust each other. And I'm wondering <laughs> if there are things that you've seen in practice that can help uh, say the the policy um, uh, the policy experts and the the people who have to do the implementation and the people who lived experience and the broader community who aren't personally going to be impacted but have a real interest in seeing this work well in society. How do we how can we start to build that trust between them so that they can come to the table and co-design? For sure, um, I. <laughs> I remember in Canada, I was talking at a, at a policy, I was talking to some policy lead people and we were talking about running an event called Policy Transformation and they were a bit, a bit funny about it and, I, and they finally said, well, P, I just want to change the name because Policy Transformation sounds like you actually want to change how we do things. <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> and so then that led to a different sort of conversation. Um, I, I think that partly, um, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, some of this happens naturally in tiny pockets. So weirdly enough, my observation is that almost every tax department globally that I've dealt with does a micro version of this. They do have policy people and implementation people in the same room rapidly iterating policy regularly. So there's a, there's a micro example of that in every jurisdiction that I've worked in for sure um, and several that I've seen where for whatever reason, uh, and it's probably because of, you know, people, um, governments have adapted to be very responsive to business needs, just less so citizens, but, you know, but we can use the pattern. So being able to say, look, you're, we already do it well here, so why can't we just extend it to other sorts of um, portfolios? Um, so amplifying patterns is helpful. Starting from the, the actual outcome, because everyone's sort of focused on they have too much work and it's all too stressful. But if you say, well, hold on, what's the impact we're trying to have? What's the shared goal that we have? 
And if you can identify a shared goal, you have a better chance of people being able to come together because ev even if they, uh, even across disciplines, you know, and, and identifying discipline friction as a thing, you know, if you get your data scientist and your designer in the same room, they will kill each other. Um, unless you can say, we will only get a better outcome because you're both in the room. And by the way, it's not that each, either of you is better or worse than the other, it's that you're different. Let's identify that you have different lexicon, different methods, different tech, like different techniques, and let's embrace that diversity as part of the strength of getting to where we need to go. Identifying discipline friction as a thing and building that into a culture that can be multidisciplinary by choice um, helps build that trust, because some of that trust is, like from my observation anyway, is pure discipline friction. Um, and then, of course, actually starting to shift to outcomes-based structures. So 20, 30 years ago, as some of you, again, are nerdy as me to know, but most of you probably won't, about 30 years ago, they made a big shift to governments all around the world where they decided to turn them into businesses. So all of the departments were structurally changed to have functional segmentation. That structural segmentation means that every, every discipline has a different cost centre and can't talk to each other unless they can give them some money <laughs> or do some cost recovery or cite a cost centre. If we can shift the structures of our departments back to what they were, which was based around outcomes, you need to have an outcomes-based cost centre and outcomes-based structure so that you can hire and maintain the cross-disciplinary set of skills and experience that you need to drive that outcome. Whereas with everyone just trying to blind baton pass between their functions, one group writing business requirements, the other group implementing, the first group saying, that's not what I meant. Well, that's what you wrote. Well, I meant this. Well, why didn't you say that? Blah, blah, blah. Um, every time you hear the word business requirements, they're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> and yet, so, so we need to identify these patterns and help people remember that they've got more in common that they haven't difference. A good approach. We have one minute left, but I think we can fit one more sneaky question in. Just one second, a lovely microphone for you. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you could um, outline or, or give any examples of once these, um, once this legislation or regulation has been written of um, either citizen groups like you were showing in New hmm. Zealand or other organisations actually consuming them. Of other organisations using them? Yes. Um, so that's starting to happen all around the world. The, um, so just from my experience, um, so the, the New Zealand one I'm pretty pleased with because um, there's, lots of, um, there's lots of departments starting to say, okay, yeah, actually this separation of rules and um, of legislation and business systems is really actually helpful to what we're trying to do. Uh, so it's definitely starting to be adopted in government itself. In New Zealand, the group that we pulled together um, was sort of loosely based on the GovZero lessons out of Taiwan. Um, but it is, I think, the world's first citizen community repository of, of legislation as code, which is pretty cool. Um, and um, so it's continuing to be built upon. They're finding new funding to get more uh, benefits put in. And the goal is to actually have a community managed repository, which is the next call for all of you. I want to build a community repository of legislation code here. That was actually the last slide, which I managed to not get to. That was really bad. Um, I want to build a uh, community repository here, um, something that we can use to test new regulation, test new legislation, something we can use to say, oh, same as benefit me, here's what the law says you're eligible for. And if the department gives you a different answer and you say, well, here's what the law says I'm eligible for, why are you giving me a different answer? And when they say, well, you don't have any operational policy in your tool, we can say, are you suggesting your operational policy conflicts with the law? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> um, you know, you got, you got to shake up the power differential, otherwise, uh, otherwise it, you know, we all take it too seriously. Um, so I want to build one of those in Australia that we can all rely upon. Every single think tank, every single research institution, Grattan here in Melbourne, case in point, keeps building out these models, these legislation and regulations code models to do their own thing. Why wouldn't we have a shared repository? Why can't we build policy infrastructure for our nation? So um, that would be my suggestion. Anyone? Yeah.